The behavior of my full self-driving beta 10.12.2 yesterday returning on a road trip from the islands in South Georgia reminded me again of a conversation that I had with James Dauma in reference to something that Andre Carpathy talked about about a year ago. And it got me wondering again if there is an issue with Tesla's full self-driving technique and whether or not they can overcome that. Let's take a look. And for those of you interested in investing, check out Webull, an amazing platform for buying and selling stocks, and now cryptocurrencies like Bitcoin, Dogecoin, and others. Open an account and get a free stock valued at up to $200, and fund your account and get another free stock valued at up to $1,600. Check out the link in the description and help the channel at the same time. Hey y'all, it's Dr. Know-It-All. So I'm going to be using some pictures here, a couple of graphics that I made, but this first graphic, I think it was from Tesla's AI day, although it might've actually been easier. Anyway, it's an image that shows how Tesla's cars are seeing the world and also about the 2.0 code that's eating the 1.0 code. I've done a bunch of videos about all this stuff, so you can certainly check them out if you're interested. On the left-hand side, the 1.0 code was what was called heuristic code, which was basically kind of a bunch of if-then statements in C++ plus and also in C, they kind of said, if you see a shape like this, it's likely a stop sign, so do something like this, right? That kind of thing. The 2.0 code, and this is from a couple of years ago, so that's actually quite different now. I think there's very little 1.0 code that's left and a lot of 2.0 code. But anyway, the 2.0 code is more of deep neural networks, convolutional neural networks, transformers, things like that, that are taking over the way that full self-driving is operating. This, of course, is all to the good. And the result of this is that Tesla is a attempting to change the raster world, the world of pixels around us that the cameras can see into a vectorized object space, into a space where it understands things as things, as objects rather than bags of points. So if, for example, we look at this central part where the car is you know, showing a bunch of camera views, you can see on this bottom left-hand view, there is a white car over there. And on the bottom right-hand view, there's a, a black car. And basically what the, the vehicle is attempting to do is turn those into vector objects and then it's using what's called a bird's eye view network or BEV net. And you can see over here, that's the BEV net that they're talking about. So essentially the sensors on the cameras go into a bunch of sort of mini neural networks that then are fused together. I think the fusion actually happens a little bit earlier than it was in this image, but anyway, that's not particularly important to what's going on here. But anyway, they go into a fusion layer, they go into a temporal layer so that they're melded into a video sequence rather than in still frame images. And then it goes into what's called the BevNet or bird's eye view network, which basically makes it a top-down view, right? So that's why we're seeing this car is sort of like a top-down view of the car. And from there, in the very, very bottom right corner, you can see like an image of what it's projecting into the space. And if you've driven full self-driving beta, you're used to the red lines indicating the edges of the road, and there's a whole bunch of other things. But basically, once you can do that, you can project your ego car into the space, and you can know where everything is, and you can drive safely, because of course, you can detect things like moving objects, road lines, road edges, cars, stop signs, etc., etc., etc. So the BEV net is really, really crucial to the way that Tesla's full self-driving works now. So what is the problem with this? My first real inklings of the potential problems with this came from my conversation with James Dama. If you haven't seen that, you should definitely check that out. He's an amazing person. But he started talking about the grid that's overlaid on the universe of the BEV network by Tesla's cars and how that could actually turn out to be rather problematic for the way that Tesla sees things, especially at high velocities. So to help explain this, I'm going to turn to this little schematic that I worked up really quick in Photoshop. You can see the ego car here is this car with kind of a blue halo around it. So it's the yellow car with the blue halo. Don't worry, it's not a Tesla. I don't know what the heck these cars are either. They're just random cars. And then of course, you've got a car that it's following going in the same direction. And then on the other side of the road, you've got a purple car going the other way. And you've got the dashed lines indicating the middle of the road. The gray is the road and the green is the background elements like the, the fields or things like that that you're driving through. So the task of the ego car here is to follow this red car, not crash into the red car, and obviously not cross over any of these dashed yellow lines or cross over the edge of the road. So it needs to understand where it is in the world, and it needs to be able to construct that in real time so it can drive safely, obviously. And of course, I've got a straight line here for the road, but the road could curve and the thing has to follow the, the 
curvature of the road, stay on the road there. It has to be able to go up and down hills, all sorts of things. This, of course, is a very simple schematic, but it's just designed to give you an idea of how all of this works. Anyway, if you were using something like LiDAR, what you would do is have a human being drive a car around and map all of this stuff out, not the cars, obviously, but the edges of the road, the center lines, all of that kind of stuff would be mapped out. And then your car would kind of know where it was and it would be able to fit within the parameters of that and drive along. Tesla's taking a completely different path here. They're going with vision only and they're constructing the entire scene interactively as the car drives. So the way to do this is to overlay a grid on top of the scene. That's kind of the way that James Dalma has described it. And I think that that's actually what's happening. And I'll tell you why in just a few minutes. But this is a really, really big grid. Obviously, the Tesla is going to have a much, much smaller grid than this. But basically, it would just project this grid out onto the scene. And it would say, OK, if this space is more than 50 percent full of car, then mark this space out as car. So you can see there's little extra you know, bits here that aren't marked out his car but that doesn't really matter that much and so what it's done is it's marked this out and it says this particular area this gridded out area is car that's moving away from me so i'm following it right now this purple gridded out area is car that is moving towards me because of course it's got video also so it can tell that the car number one is on the wrong side of the street so it should be going opposite of me but also that it's coming towards me at very high velocity so it understands how this all works and then my ego car also knows that it has a number of grid marks in between it and the car that it's approaching. So it has a sense of where the cars are. It has a sense of physical space. It understands, you know, you could think of this as like a chess board or a checkers board, or if you've played any kind of board games, obviously, you know, it's the kind of movements, right? So you can move your bishop or your queen or whatever. So the car is sort of thinking of itself in terms of a game like that. It's gridded out the whole world. It understands what objects are in the scene and it's able to place them within this gridded out world. So this is all great. So what's the issue with this? Well, the issue comes with the fact that every single one of these grid squares requires some memory and processing from the vehicle. So again, I'm going to give a very oversimplified example, but let's say that the vehicle can only process this big of a grid, right? So from here to here, as opposed to the entire scene before. Well, the issue with that is now this car thinks it's alone on the road, right? It's still processing the edge of the road here. It's processing the yellow lines in the middle. It's processing the other edge, but it's like, hey, I'm all by myself, no big deal. Maybe this ego car is driving very, very rapidly and this car is actually stopped at a stoplight or a stop sign or something like that. And only when the grid gets to the point where it actually begins to see this car, will this car go, oh crap, I better slow down quickly. And if you've driven full self-driving beta, you may very well have noticed that what it does is, especially at stop signs or, or stoplights or things like that, it will stop pretty abruptly. It doesn't stop as smoothly as a human does because it doesn't seem to notice things as fast as human beings do. And that's exactly what is giving me an indication that this is actually correct, that James Dalma's interpretation is correct. And it's going to be a bigger issue at highway speeds than it is at lower speeds. And the basic reason for that is relatively straightforward, right? The vehicle is going at a relatively low speed. So let's say it's only covering one of these grid squares per second. Like, I don't just, you know, <laughs> it doesn't really matter how big they are. And obviously it will cover a lot more than that. But if it's only covering one grid square per second, and let's say that this is like four grid squares up. So it's going to go boop, boop, boop. It's going to see the car. And then it's still going to have like one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight seconds, right? It's going to have a very long time to slow down. But what if this thing is moving really rapidly? Rapidly and it's covering like five or six of these grid squares per second, right? So it's covering like that much space. By the time it sees this car, it's almost on top of it. Now, obviously, this is an exaggeration. These cars would be much, much further apart, but it would still be pretty close because it's going relatively quickly. So by the time it sees the car, the, the number of grid squares is the same, but the amount of time is much, much reduced. And so the vehicle is, you know, really coming up rapidly on the car or the stoplight or the stop sign or whatever it is. And by the time it sees it and it recognizes, recognizes it, it's got to break relatively violently in order to avoid hitting the car or coming to the stop at the stoplight or whatever it is. And as it turned out yesterday on our drive home from the islands in South Georgia, we went through a bunch of back roads, which have, you know, kind of windy two lane roads, just like the, you know, schematic I'm showing here. And then they have stoplights that are just out in the middle of nowhere. So you're just driving along on a nice two or four lane road and a stoplight will 
be up ahead of you some distance away. And what I was doing was I was noticing how long it took the vehicle to actually see this stoplight. So it was definitely driving in full self-driving beta because anything that's not like an interstate type highway, it drives in the full self-driving beta. And you can tell because it's got the red lines on the side, the visualization is very different looking. But basically what would happen is I would see the light turn red let's say a half a mile away, you know, long, long ways away, because these are long straight roads. And so I could see that and I'm like, oh, the light's red and the car would go and the car would go and I would kind of go like, okay, when is it going to see that light? And right around the time that it began to visualize the light that you could see the light start to show up in the visualization of the full self-driving computer, then it would start to break. But by then at a guess, it was like maybe 400-ish meters away from that light. So it had to slow down pretty quickly because again, you're going highway speeds so you know you're going over 100 kilometers an hour and suddenly you've got to slow down in 400 meters or 500 meters or something along those lines so it's got to slow down really really rapidly when it gets to that point point. and therein lies the rub and that also probably explains why tesla's full self-driving computer their vision only system has been limited to only 80 miles an hour on freeways in the united states until 10.12 where it actually got up to 85 miles an hour but it does follow with a little more distance and by the way that's really nice if if you're driving you know out west where i am we really don't have speed limits that are high enough that that affects me that much but i'm sure out west people really appreciate that extra five miles an hour that you can drive but i believe that the basic reason why this has been a problem and why full self-driving is still an issue at high speed is because this bevnet grid the bird's eye view network grid is only so big it can only extend out so far so basically if you imagine I don't know, like a bank of fog or something. So if you're driving and it's not a clear day, you can't see a long ways away and there's just like fog in front of you. And so all you can see is things coming out of the fog as they get relatively close to you. That makes you a lot more nervous as a driver. And of course you might have to do more violent maneuvers because all of a sudden a car comes out of the fog and you're like, oh crap, I got to stop or a stoplight comes out or a stop sign or something like that. So basically what's happening here is the vehicle is kind of blinded past a certain distance. I'll put it at half a kilometer, 400, 500 meters, somewhere in that range. And again, when you're driving at slow speeds in a city environment, that's plenty of space, tons and tons of space. But when you're driving in a environment where you're going very, very quickly and covering that grid space really rapidly, that's actually a problem. So what are the solutions to all of this? Well, the one solution is to just always drive slowly, but that's probably not gonna work. Another solution is to increase your hardware processing power so you can make a bigger grid. And the final solution is to actually somehow code this all up with the same hardware that you've got using better software. My guess from version 10.12 is that they're actually getting to be able to use the current hardware to project out a longer grid in the front. And so hopefully that's what they're doing and that is going to allow them to be able to drive more rapidly and to be able to react to things further away than they have before. So just as a reminder here, this is all speculation. I don't work for Tesla. And of course, if anybody who does work for Tesla, especially in their vision and AI department wants to respond to this, I'm happy to be educated about all of this. But in the meantime, I think that's what's going on. I think that basically the car has kind of blinders on or imagine fog at a certain distance and it can only see a certain distance away, which is why it has a tendency to brake a little more violently than you might expect when it's driving on full self-driving if you're using it that way. Do I expect Tesla to overcome this? Yes, I absolutely do. But it is a really, really complicated challenge and it involves more memory and more processing power. So good luck to the team at Tesla. Hopefully you guys will get it figured out real soon. All right, I hope you enjoyed this episode and found it fun and thought-provoking. If you did, please do like it so other people can find it, speaking of AI, and also consider subscribing for more of this kind of content. As always, a huge shout out to my patrons on Patreon. Thank you all so much. I know I've been all over the place the past couple of weeks, but I have really appreciated a lot of the conversations that we've had and all of the camaraderie and everything. So thank you all so much. And of course, if you want to join the team, just check out the link in the description. And if you're interested in a whole bunch of really cool merch, check out our merch store link is in the description. We have Tesla bot t-shirts, the Tesla meme t-shirt, success is a possible outcome, 4680 battery cells. All of that stuff is on t-shirts, mugs, tumblers, and on and on. So check it out.
And for those of you interested in investing, check out Webull, an amazing platform for buying and selling stocks, and now cryptocurrencies like Bitcoin, Dogecoin, and others. Open an account and get a free stock valued at up to $200, and fund your account and get another free stock valued at up to $1,600. Check out the link in the description and help the channel at the same time. Thank you. And finally, don't forget we are both Tesla and Amazon affiliates. If you look in the description, you can see how going shopping for a solar roof, a power wall, or anything on Amazon helps out the channel. In the meantime, I'll see you in the next one. Bye-bye.